Well, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, we're going to be doing something that I've never done before. I've never given a talk from the iPad before, so I'm going to be sort of learning the interface while we go here. That's okay, because most of the talk is going to be me talking anyway. So we're going to talk today about um, classics and why the classics matter. And as you know, this discussion that we're having here, this group, is about understand, an exploration of understanding who we are. That's what's written in the words around the little wheel there. And as Rodney said, we're, the idea is to understand the spokes which make us different and how we all come together into this one metaphor of the wheel. And those of you who were here last week heard Sanford suggest that maybe we needed a slightly different metaphor. Go. <laughs> he suggested that maybe what we need to focus on is not so much this, our separation as spokes, but what we have in common. Or as he said, let's look at the hub rather than the wheel itself. And I thought that was a wonderful and provocative suggestion. I thought I'd, I'd take him up on that and ask the question, what do we here in this room today, right now, all have in common? What is it that we all share? I might take a moment in your mind and jot down a couple notes about what we all have in common. And don't forget the obvious. We all breathe oxygen. We're all at the University of Idaho. Uh, we're all, we all have parents. We all have grandparents. There are many things that we have in common. We all speak English. Some of us, that may not be our first language, but we speak it. Uh, several of us in here, I notice, do speak other languages. But uh, I'm focusing on what we all share, and what we all share principally through our being human beings. So the real question that I want to ask is not who are we, not who we are, but the burning question is invisible. <laughs> who are we? What is this we that we're talking about, this all-encompassing uh, commonality, and what's the role that it plays in the university? So from that very general introduction, this is the argument that I'm going to try to make today. Um, I'm going to argue that one of the things that we in this room share is we all have a Western academic culture which is grounded in humanism. So we are at a point in history where this sort of university has been being developed for 2,500 years. It's been being developed in the West, so I, I realize that there are important contributions to be made by Native Americans and, and Eastern traditions. The oldest university in the world is the Nalanda University in India. Um, but I'm going to focus on the Western tradition because that's what we share in this room. And some of us have those other traditions as well, but let's focus on what we share for a moment. We are at the uh, culmination, if you will, of the Western University. So the Western University, as we see it now, is fragmented and unbalanced. I'm just going to assert that. I think it's true. Uh, that's why we have meetings like this. This is why we talk about interdisciplinary work. This is why we ask people to work with each other. It's because we have a sense that something is broken that probably shouldn't be broken. I mean literally broken apart, not broken in the sense of not working, broken in the sense of being separated. And I, I think that where that comes from is from um, the Industrial Revolution and modernism. In the Industrial Revolution, we stopped asking so much what we have in common and started talking more about what individual specific things we can produce. And it was a focus on efficiency rather than, than holism. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I do think in the case of the university, that industrial tradition has fragmented us in unfortunate ways. Also, um, so I, I'm, I'm going to argue that the way you get around that fragmentation is you pay attention to what happened before that fragmentation happened. So I'm going to go back 2,000 years, 2,500 years, in fact. And I'm going to look at what the university was like when it began, when it was founded. What common basis do we all share, which was also present there when the idea of a university um, was first created. And that is our humanist core, the humanist tradition that goes back to the classical Greeks. And this is why I think studying classical culture works. Boy, that color is awful, isn't it? <laughs> oh my god. Well, you're all going to have headaches by the end of the day. One of the things about, about classical languages and literature is that it is just astoundingly beautiful. If you've ever read Homer in the Greek 
Or I remember once actually walking out of a, a class, it was Celia Lushnig's class on the Medea, and we read a passage which was so moving, I just couldn't stay in the room. The classics are incredibly beautiful. They can be incredibly inspiring. And they're easy to remember once you get studying them. I'm not recommending that everyone learn Greek, but although it would be a good idea. Um, another interesting thing about the classical Greek culture 2,500 years ago is it's kind of familiar, you know, because it, it is a Western tradition. They have ideas like of individualism and of democracy and of obligation and family and stuff that we all share today, but they're also very, very different. They have a completely different set of gods, a set of gods that we have absolutely no temptation to take seriously. They have a different background, and they, they all knew Homer. They have the idea of going out and watching a play every Friday night and remembering it and talking about it for the next 20 years. So in some senses, the Greeks were very alien. And I think that's an advantage. If you want to get beyond the fracturing in the modern world, you have to somehow uh, transcend your assumptions. And one way to do that is to find something which is alien enough that you don't try to apply your own perspective and what you bring to the discussion. It's got to be alien enough, but it's got to be familiar enough that you can understand it. Okay? And I, I think the classical Greek uh, culture hits that spot, that sweet spot. Um, I said that. And the last thing is what really troubles me, and this, is, this has troubled me for a few years. Uh, Greek culture has been around, classical literature and languages have been around 2,500 years. So there might be a temptation to think, gosh, that's old. We, we can never lose them. They, they must, there must be something terribly permanent about them. That's not true. It is very easy to lose important parts of our culture like the Western tradition of the classical languages and literature. It's happened before. Very important parts of the classical uh, have been lost for 1,500 years. I, I mean completely lost. No one in the world knew they were there. And it could happen again. Uh, there was a time when the Hellenists, the post-classical post Greeks, had developed a level of technology and science which, in my opinion, is what the Romans relied on when they built Rome. There's some amazing technological feats in Rome. That entire body of technology was lost. Those guys, the scientists, were used as slaves by the Romans, and after the Romans used them and they died, there were no more. And then came the Dark Ages. Okay? So it is actually a mistake to think that because something is old, it's permanent. It takes a conscious, active effort to retain important parts of our history, in my opinion, and that's why we tell stories. And um, that's what I'm hoping to do a little bit of. But first, I'd like to tell you a story. Because I'm getting real excited. This will calm me down. OK. Once upon a time, sheep were scary. They were these animals which made strange noises and pranced around on these crags that we were afraid to go on. We couldn't really get at them. So we were kind of afraid of them. So uh, some of them had big horns. Those big horns are themselves kind of scary. And they are, if you've ever seen like, like a longhorn ram. So what we did to deal with that reality is that we drew pictures and made up stories about the sheep. <clears throat> and we kept our distance because they were scary. Then, we got the idea that um, we could build a hedge. And if we built a hedge and put the sheep inside the hedge, then we would have access to them. And if we had access to them, we might, uh, oh, oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> You're going to get the whole story very quickly. <laughs> I don't even know what slide I'm on now. <laughs> Let's do this. Hello. That's it. So we built a hedge around them. <laughs> oh, screw it. Maybe I'll just read it to you. But the pictures are so pretty. And I'm a technology guy. This is really embarrassing. So um, <laughs> uh, we, we built a hedge in this story. 
and we discovered that it was easier to grow and catch the sheep. They got fat, they got happy. We discovered that some of those sheep, even though they had horns, they weren't so scary after all. In fact, they made kind of nice noises. And we discovered that these were yummy, yummy sheep. They had a, there were advantages to being able to get at the sheep. Now, are you going to flip on me, or are you going to go way forward? So we became complacent. We sort of neglected the hedges that were holding the sheep together. And when you neglect, neglect things, they fall apart. The hedges became porous. Some of the sheep wandered off. Some of the woolly ones ran away so we could no longer make sweaters. Some of the yummy ones ran away so we were hungry and cold. And some of the scary ones just disappeared, which was kind of sad because we discovered after they were gone that it's nice to have a scary thing around once in a while. So we eventually got the idea that we needed to rebuild the hedge. But we, being smart Westerners, decided that we would rebuild the hedge better than before. We'd build the hedge and build lots of little hedges inside so that we could separate the sheep into various kinds of sheep. And that way, when we wanted to eat a sheep, it'd be easy to get one. When we wanted to make wool, it'd be easy to find one to make the wool from. And those scary ones, we could just put them off in the corner and look at them and enjoy their being there without actually having to interact with them. So the idea was to rebuild the hedge and rebuild it better than before by having all of these subdivisions. The problem with that is the sheep got lazy. You're blowing my timing. OK, so we decided that what we, <laughs> what we would do, and this is where we live today, come back, is that we would try to uh, allow the sheep to wander between their little compartments. The way we do that is we take a chainsaw to the hedge in various places and just randomly start cutting little slits and passages between the hedges. This is like today when we're breaking down the barriers between disciplines by providing these little tiny opportunities for people to mix. The problem is that the iPad doesn't want to cooperate. The, the problem is that these, these little gaps all over the place were really too small for the sheep. So some of the sheep got scared by the sound of the, of the chainsaws and ran away. And some of the sheep just stood very still, frozen like sheep will do. And again, compare that to the modern faculty in the university. And you get the idea of the analogy. And then. An elder stood up in front of a room with a slow iPad and suggested that <laughs> perhaps we should rebuild the hedge we started with, the ancient hedge. Let's rebuild that. Let's bring all of the sheep together. Let's put some, uh, some yummy salad in the middle so that the sheep have some reason to associate with each other. And just let the sheep mingle. And that's, that's the plea that I'm making. Just let the sheep be sheep. OK, that's the parable. That's all we need, right? So I, I can go now. <laughs> I don't know why it's not shifting. OK, there we are, the history of the Western University. And this is the only slide where the animation really mattered. So we'll see how this goes. So anyway, to, to explain that uh, parable, I know enough about parables to know that you really shouldn't explain a parable. You shouldn't go into detail on it. But obviously, I wrote that one with a moral in mind. And the idea was that uh, there was a time in prehistory when uh, the Europeans, of course they weren't Europeans because there was no Europe at the time, basically told stories. And we've got, they told some beautiful stories, beautiful cave paintings and such. Uh, then came the classical Greece. And in classical Greece, uh, they developed the idea of an academy. And the idea of the academy is you get a bunch of smart, creative people, and you put them in the same place, and you let them mingle. So in this case, they're like the sheep. And the, the academy itself is the boundary around the sheep, blah, blah, blah. Then came the Dark Ages, where we actually forgot what the academy was like. And this association of intellectuals began to crumble. We had the writings of the Greeks, but we used them as purely rote exercises. To the Benedictine monks, for example, the virtuous thing to do was to keep busy. So they made copies of ancient Greek scrolls, not because they wanted to preserve the ancient Greek scrolls, but because they wanted to keep busy. In fact, they weren't supposed to read some of those scrolls. We were supposed to just copy them. 
Okay? So we neglected this, uh, everything we got from the Greeks, and it caused problems. It caused our intellectual system to become very porous. In the Renaissance, but, but which I'm saying around 1300 <coughs> on for a few, year, few hundred years, we rediscovered the classics, and that's an interesting story in itself. Uh, we discovered the contents of the classical writings, in large part because the Arabs opened up trade routes with the East, where the documents had been kept sort of in hiding, and no one really bothered about destroying them there. So we rediscovered the classics, and we rediscovered modern science, um, modern science being the experimental method, and we developed this thing called the university, called that, the university. Uh, basically, that says the university of scholars and teachers. And this was the heritage that we live in right here in this room. The modern university is basically that creation from the Middle Ages. And um, today, we live in an age of intellectual fracking. That's why I call it. This, this idea where we have this ossified structure, we're hoping that if we just shatter enough barriers that things will seep out of it. And I'm suggesting that uh, maybe what we need for tomorrow is a more rational approach where we consciously try to recover some of the virtues that we began with. So I didn't really mean to interpret that story that much, but there we go. Okay. So. What do I mean when I talk about the classics and humanism? In a word, when I talk about humanism, I'm talking about what Pythag Pythagoras? What Protagor Protagoras, Protagoras, <laughs> that guy, was saying. When he said man is the measure of all things, he did not mean that things were important only because they have a relation to man. What he meant was the things that we can understand, we can understand using our human capabilities. We can use reason to understand the world. We can use our passions to react to the world. We have the capacities within us as human beings to allow us to uh, approach the world and understand it. Or in, the, in their language, we share specific excellences with which we can understand the world. That's where science comes in, with which we can uh, get to the next slide. With which we can understand things like big movements in our own history, like war and peace, culture, civilization, and politics. We can understand how to live together better using our own facilities, rather than uh, relying on doctrine or uh, command or intuition or fear. We can actually use our human capabilities. What are those human capabilities? Here's three that I think are important. Reason, passion, and community. By reason, I mean the ability to think clearly about what you're observing and to deduce the consequences of what you're, what you're observing. Okay? So that human capacity to reason is one of the excellences that are the basis of um, humanism. Passion, there are many human passions that I think some of them got swept under the rug, uh, especially in the, in the um, well, especially in the post-classical era. Passions such as a thirst for justice. Um, love for each other, you know, a sense of community, curiosity, passions such as anger, but anger at the appropriate things. You know, so, so the human passions are part of us, and I suggest that they're part of our humanism that we ought to recover. Now, let's get into some specifics. We have 15, 20 minutes. Okay, so first let's talk a little bit about understanding the world. Uh, this passage, which I'll probably read out loud in a minute because I can't resist the temptation. Uh, this is a passage from a book called De Rerum Natura, On the Nature of Things, by Lucretius, who wrote at about the time of, well, 2,000 years ago, about 2,000 years ago. It's a fascinating book. This text is several thousand lines um, I forget exactly how many, but a lot. And it's actually a physics textbook. So it's a physics textbook written in verse. We don't see much of that these days. <laughs> and what the argument of this textbook was, what the only things that really exist are matter and motion. There are these tiny little things that can't be broken up called atoms from atomus, not able to be chopped up, and atoms in motion. And from atoms, and motion, we get everything we see. 
Then Lucretius went on to say, what are the consequences of that? And he pointed out that there are consequences for ethics. There are consequences for society. There are consequences for public health, for goodness sake. And he went through this whole list of consequences from that doctrine, and he did it in incredibly beautiful verse. I think that's interesting. The reason he did it in verse is what this passage tells us. He did it in verse because those truths are truths whether we're happy with them or not, you know, whether we're comfortable with them or not. And there's some argument to be made that we should be comfortable with a world in which there's nothing but matter and motion. In fact, you hear it all the time these days. Lucretius' answer was that shouldn't keep you from learning about matter and motion. You have to be led up to the point where you understand what I'm teaching you about physics, and in order to lead up to that, I'm going to present it in a beautiful way. That's what this is about. I write clear verse about dark matters to rim the lesson, as it were, with honey, hoping this way to hold your mind with verses while you are learning all that form, that pattern of the way that things are. That's an attitude toward science and understanding that I think we've largely lost. This idea that it really doesn't matter what our reaction to the conclusions is, and it can still be beautiful to learn them. Uh, this book, by the way, this is interesting. The poem of Lucretius is the one I was thinking of earlier when I said that some of our heritage has been lost for 1,500 years. The poem of Lucretius was completely gone from Western civilization for 1,500 years. It was rediscovered <coughs> by um, Poggio, uh, forgot his full name, in about the 1500s, and he rediscovered one manuscript in an old abbey that no one paid attention to. And he made his own copy by hand. This is the guy that, enveloped, that invented the italic font, by the way. And he brought it back with him to Rome, where they made copies of it. And all of a sudden, Lucretius is getting out to all, a bunch of people. And this idea that the world is just matter and motion, and that the gods really don't care about us, and uh, we should be able to look at something like a plague and still see beauty in it or understand it. This idea was very radical. And it was starting to get public once, uh, once Lucretius's poem got out. This particular book is the front piece for Montaigne's copy of Lucretius. This is Montaigne's signature in the background there. And some later owner wrote over it. Montaigne not only read Lucretius, he kept very, very careful notes. Um, just recently, we discovered the first Greek copy of Lucretius. It was in Herculaneum, you know, the place that was covered by ash and Pompeii, in the form of a little tiny scroll by just recently, I mean, what, about 120 years ago, I think. Uh, so we discovered the scroll, we brought it out, and the person who brought it out tried to read it by opening it up. And what happens when you open up a scroll that's been under volcanic ash? It starts to crumble, so we lost a lot of it there. Turns out this scroll was in a library of a Roman, and the library of this Roman was dedicated to the teachings of Epicurus. Epicurus was one of the first Greek atomists. Epicurus wrote a lot. He wrote enough to fill up an entire library. We don't have a single work of Epicurus left today, not one. Lucretius' entire poem is an explanation of Epicurus's teachings. So even something so influential that Cicero, Montaigne, and others learn from it, it's gone today. Maybe it's in the scroll buried under the ash and we haven't discovered it yet, uh, but it is possible to lose our classical heritage. This is, this is actually a painting on the wall at the Marine Biology Lab in Woods Hole, where I, I worked for a summer. Um, I find it incredibly moving. I think it, it shows, it illustrates the sense of angst which we sort of expect to have when we face things like DNA engineering and nuclear weapons. Uh, the modern world is a scary place. It's got horns. The modern world is a scary place. And I don't want to feel that way. I would rather feel that way. So I would kind of like to recover the tradition that I can understand the world with a sense of beauty rather than a sense of abject terror. Very non-modern. Okay. Another lesson we can learn about the Greeks, from the Greeks, is uh, we can learn about important facts about human civilization, such as the fact that we do tend to go to war. 
and we do it a lot. This particular map is a map from Herodotus. Herodotus is known as the father of history because he was the first person to have an idea of history. History in the sense that if you want to understand people, you have to go talk to them. So Herodotus's radical idea was that if he wanted to understand the causes of the Persian War, that he had to go out and talk to the people who fought in the Persian War, which were the Greeks, people right around here, against the Persians, people here. And the, the Persians outnumbered the Greeks a lot, like a million to a thousand. Um, and the Greeks won. And Herodotus wanted to explain this. And he figured the only way to explain it was to go to Libya and figure out what the Libyans really thought and to go to this place and that place and that place. And that's where we get history. Um, where to go with this? So this is the first, this is the opening of Herodotus's history. My researchers are here set down to preserve the memory of the past by putting on record the astonishing achievements, both of our own and of other peoples, and of how they came into conflict. So he was going out and developing history so that we wouldn't forget where we came from, and so that we would understand the conflict which we just got out of. This map is interesting. In the passage of Herodotus where he talks about this map, he rails against the older map that came before it. And the older map that came before it was pretty much like this, except that ocean went all the way around. And Herodotus argued that we don't know that the ocean goes all the way around because we've never been there. So he said, if we're going to draw an accurate map, you don't draw the ocean all the way around. You draw a border up to where you've been and then stop, which was a radical notion at the time, and I think a beautiful notion. So anyway, he's trying to explain this, this um, incredibly important world war, and he does it by going out and understanding the humanism underlying the civilizations of everyone involved. And this is where some of the people in the room uh, have been in this event. Uh, believe it or not, we human beings still have war with us. We still go to war. We still come back from war. And if we really want to understand why, then we have to preserve the memory of the past by putting down the accomplishments of the people that we're at war with and of ourselves. So um, Rosanna L'Oreal in the back of the room somewhere um, sponsored this Classics Meets the Vets event where we got together a, a panel of combat veterans and other veterans and some, uh, some humanists and psychologists. We got together a panel and we had students read passages from classical texts like Sophocles' Ajax and the Philoctetes and, and other pa classical plays about war and about returning from war. So the students read these passages and then we had a discussion with the audience after each one. And it was an incredibly moving event. The lesson I took away from this was um, that if we talk about that ancient thing which is sort of removed from us and we discover that their experience of war was the same as our experience of war and their experience of coming home is the same as our experience of coming home, then we might learn something about ourselves that we wouldn't learn any other way because it's easier to look out than in, right? So we had this discussion and I'll tell you one poignant, really poignant moment for me of this was when uh, one of the combat vets stood up and he talked about, um, I think it was his, his platoon, he had a buddy in the platoon who had a guardian angel and he would talk to the guardian angel and, and be there and the other people in the platoon, rather than treating him like he was nuts, uh, just treated the angel like an extra person in the platoon. And then I got to thinking about Odysseus in the Iliad talking to Athena, and I had never really thought of the possibility that Odysseus, out on the battlefield, really does see Athena come down, really does get advice from Athena, listens to her, does it, and his buddies follow him because they've come to respect that imaginary person who's become very real to him in the context of the battle. So here's a book that I've read, I don't know how many times, in both the Greek and the English. And this one comment from one of the veterans at this event caused me to see the whole book in a totally new way, and Greek religion in a totally new way. That's the kind of thing you can have when you have discussions about 
classical literature meeting modern themes which really aren't modern at all. Okay? We're hoping to do this again next year, by the way. Probably more I could say there, but let's not. I could talk about Athenian warfare for a long time. It was a fascinating thing. Actually, maybe I will here. So another thing we can appreciate from the Greeks, from studying the Greeks, is we can appreciate better how we can actually live together and how our political society is organized. Because democracy, after all, began with the classical Greeks. They invented it. They lost it. They reinvented it. They lost it. They reinvented it. They lost it. And the tradition that we have, our founding fathers, actually went back to the classical Greek uh, description of democracy in order to figure out many things of, uh, in our political system. This guy is Thucydides, Thucydides if you want. Uh, no, it's not Thucydides. Thucydides, he wrote a history of the uh, Peloponnesian War. The Peloponnesian War was a war that the Greeks had with themselves. So there were two great states. There was Sparta, which was a land-bound uh, state, a very militaristic state. And there was the Athenian League, the Athenian League was a collection of um, islands and cities all, all around that eastern part of the Mediterranean. Uh, and of course, Athens at the center. And in the Athenian League, they would collect tribute from the far-flung places, uh, tax, really. And then they would use this to build up a very powerful navy. And it was basically, the, the Peloponnesian War was a naval battle against a land-based force and a naval battle based on this far-flung empire where some of the places in the empire didn't really want to be part of the empire at all, and they sort of resented it. And the Athenians lost this one. <clears throat> one of the reasons, and Thucydides wrote this book to try to figure out why they lost it. And this is the conclusion he came to. Justice will not come to Athens until those who are not injured are as indignant as those who are injured. So basically, he was arguing that respect for others can lead to the collapse of your civilization if you're not careful. Now, and again, I could talk about the Athenian military for a long time. Uh, naval warfare has an interesting aspect to it. In naval warfare, you're rowing together, so you've got to be in harmony with the person next to you. You can't see the person who's telling you when to row. There's someone up above decks behind you who's saying, row, row, row. So you have to respond to the command without, uh, without really knowing that, that it's being given other than by that cue. You don't know where you're going. You could at any moment be rammed, which was one of the strategies in naval warfare. If you rammed, the boat could go down any minute, right? So you're next to someone who you grew up with that is helping you row the boat. The boats themselves were contributed. It was an honor to buy one of these boats for the Athenian Navy. It was a great honor. So uh, generals were selected by the people, it was a democracy, and when a general was selected, the general had the honor of buying some boats for the Navy, and they were very happy to do it. So this, the reason I'm pointing this out is that's quite different from the way we go to war today. Today we, we fly drones remotely, sometimes. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, we do have things like the, the Navy team that went in a couple times, and that's more like the old-fashioned way. But we do have a lot of warfare where it's disconnected from others. And we're building up resentment around the world because of this, right? And how do we have justice come to America? Well, one way is for us to become as uh, indignant as those who are injured, even though we're not injured. Another lesson from this is that um, in Athens, the 1%, the very rich, voluntarily spent huge amounts of money to help the country. And not only did they do that, they went out with the men on the boats. The generals went out on the boats in order to, uh, to do their generaling. Um, it's very different from today. And there, there's a movement going on right now, you may have heard of it, the 1% the or Occupy movements, where people are getting tired of an oligarchy where um, there seems to be a one-way flow of benefits. This, this seems like a very modern phenomenon. It certainly is in American society. I would suggest that if we had all read Thucydides, 
we might understand a little bit better how that divide came apart, came, came about, and what we could do about it. Thucydides talks about uh, the role of persuasion versus force by presenting the arguments that people presented word for word. He talks about um, <clears throat> justice. He talks about working together. It's uh, a phenomenally enlightening work to read. I know some of us have read it in here, but just out of curiosity, how many of you have read Thucydides, Peloponnesian War? Yeah, that's what I thought. Most of you haven't. How many of you have never heard of it until I mentioned it? See, that's very interesting. I spoke to my father-in-law the other day, and he told, I told him I was going to do this talk, and, and he said um, that everything he had read, he, he knew about classics, he'd learned by reading it on his own. And I asked him, well, how did you know what to read? And he said, well, in high school Latin, we sort of mentioned all of these texts. And I'm like, stop right there. <laughs> People today don't know what classical literature to read because they don't even know what's there in many cases. We, we should really try to restore that. Uh, why am I talking about the Greek classics specifically? Does anyone recognize the painting? It's, it's the, uh, the uh, cat, well, it's written School down there, Athens. School of Athens by Raphael. <coughs> Raphael did not call it the School of Athens, but, and it's not really a painting, it's a fresco, but um, it's one you see a lot. Again, I could do a whole class on this painting. I won't. I'll try to limit myself to just a few minutes. This is a painting of the great minds in Western history that were just being rediscovered at the time of Raphael. There's Greek philosophers in there, there's actually some others also, there's Maimonides and some others. But the thing about this picture, and again, we could go on and on. This is a bunch of intellectually active, curious people together having discussions, reading and writing. Um, that's the objective, the humanist objective of the, uh, of the classical academy that I would like to recover a sense of. Um, it's just a beautiful painting. Now, now, normally when you see this painting, you just see parts of the middle cut out and blown up. I wanted to show you the whole thing because you'll notice well over half, maybe two-thirds of the, of the artwork is architectural. Why? Was he just lazy? I think it's because he was emphasizing that there is a solid foundation to the academy. There is a way to enclose the academy so that people are together in a place that they know is going to be there. And that movement off to the back, those preceding arches, give you a sense that there is movement to be had. You're not just closed up in a room. And these two central figures striding forward is sort of emphasizing that. So I, th I think the purpose of the architectural background there, it's not merely decorative. I think it's there to emphasize that this is a community of scholars in the academy. Uh, of course, this never really happened. Many of these thinkers were uh, not contemporaneous. So why do I think we should teach this? I think our students will understand more. You'll know about Thucydides. You'll at least know he's there. You can look at a painting like this, and if someone tells you that's Heraclitus, you'll know what that means, right? If someone tells you that's Heraclitus, but his face is the face of Michelangelo, which it is, then you'll know that this is really saying that uh, Michelangelo is carrying on the tradition of Heraclitus, which was one of the pre classical uh, scientists, if you will, in Greece, a philosopher and scientist. Uh, where's another one? Leonardo da Vinci is in there too as Plato. So Plato appears in here with the face of, of Leonardo da Vinci. If you have some classics background, you will be able to appreciate things like this picture in a way that you never could otherwise. You'll be able to appreciate um, operas because you'll know the characters a little bit. Uh, Shakespeare. Shakespeare becomes a whole new reading when you know what he's talking about. And, and Shakespeare is magnificent. I think Shakespeare is right up there with Homer, personally. Um, so one reason why I think that we should return the Greek classics to a place of honor in our university is it's really going to help our students. More than that, our students are eventually going to be citizens. I mean, they're they're going to stop being students and go out and have lives, most of them. And some of them will be professors like me and, and never really leave. And, it's our obligation to have them be prepared for citizenship. And one of the ways to prepare for citizenship is to understand 
how our political system is based and to understand what the limits of democracy are, to understand the role of persuasion and protest. Um, all of these things which are discussed in the classical literature. So I think that by returning to some study of the classics, our students will become better citizens and then everyone benefits. Uh, from the scientist, I'm a scientist, okay? I'm a practicing scientist. Right now I do um, microbial biology and I'm a computer scientist so I develop algorithms and build big computers and all that stuff. I think that by studying the classics you improve science. And the way you improve science with the classics is it makes you not afraid to ask big questions. These guys over here, Thales and these guys over on the left, that side, they were asking questions like, what is the world made of? What sort of stuff? What are the consequences of the world being made of that stuff? Uh, if you read some of the modern scientific literature today, it will be about things like, if I take this atom out of that molecule, how does the molecule change its shape? Very, very specific. And that's good stuff. It's important stuff. But I think we need the courage to ask some bigger questions. Like these days, we should be asking ourselves, what is life? Where did life come from? Why is there something rather than nothing? Um, you know, there are genuinely big questions to be asked. And by looking at the world through the eyes of people who, didn't have, who don't have our sophistication, uh, we'll be more ready to ask those big questions. Now, when you start asking big questions in a university where there's all kinds of people, you start having discussions. And these, these discussions are of a type that you would not have otherwise. So imagine a room with physicists and humanists and musicians and poets all together discussing what is life. That would be a very interesting discussion. One of the reasons I came to the University of Idaho and one of the reasons I've stayed is that this is a small enough community that you can run into people from other disciplines and it's a friendly enough community that people are willing to talk to you even if you're saying stupid, wild, crazy ass shit. <laughs> it's a technical term. <clears throat> so by studying the classics, we have a common language to speak, and I think we have an appreciation, a better appreciation for a university-wide discourse about big questions. Uh, this event is an example of that. Thank you, Rodney, for doing it. This is exactly the sort of thing that I would like to see promoted more. <coughs> but the real reason I think we ought to be teaching the classics, and I'm not going to harp on it because it sounds too much like preaching, is I think we have an ethical obligation to respect our ancestors by remembering them. And our ancestors are the people that produced the Western civilization that we are now benefiting from, beginning largely with the classical Greeks. I think we have an ethical obligation to remember where we came from and to appreciate it. I also think we have an ethical obligation to our children and our children's children and our children's children's children to make sure that these beautiful works of the human mind do not disappear. So in my opinion, the most important reason for returning the classics to their place of honor in the university is an ethical one, not a practical one. Sure, there are practical benefits too, but it's the right thing to do. I don't even know what the next slide is. Let's find out. Oh, I remember. Oh, this is going to be awful. Um, <clears throat> this will be more interesting to you up on the web page. I put down a list of some of the key figures up here and I keyed them out so you can tell who is where in case you get curious. Look at that on the web page. No need to go through it right now. In other words, the message I'm giving is remember the sheep. Or as Sophocles said, ignorant people don't know what good they hold in their hands until they have flung it away. I would like to see this be a real inheritor of that. I would personally like to see a university return a place of honor to uh, classical studies and classical education. Um, blah, 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 blah. I should stop in time for questions. So now I'd like to thank some of my teachers. Um, Amy Cass was uh, my, my teacher at the University of Idaho when I studied there, she helped me publish my first paper which was uh, an explanation of Herodotus and why Herodotus was doing what he was doing. Leon Cass taught me about Lucretius and Aristotle and all of those guys. 
So I consider them my ancestors, intellectual ancestors. Cecilia was uh, very important to me appreciating the classics. When I first came to the University of Idaho, one of the reasons I chose this university was Cecilia and um, we had a good classics department, okay? I think we had a very good classics department and that was important to me. And each time I've thought of taking another job somewhere else, I look at their catalog and I turn to the classics section, then I turn to the mathematics section, and then I turn to art. And if they're weak in those areas, it's not a place I want to go, okay? So thanks to Cecilia, uh, Rosanna, who's here actually, taught me that um, you can actually make significant differences in the lives of people now by introducing them to the classics and having them experience it. Again, she was the one that organized that classics for vet um, deal. She did other things too, which are worth remembering, like teaching grade school kids about the classics. Uh, Larry Forney is the guy that convinced me that I should go ahead and put the sheep in. I wasn't going to. I thought it was too cute. And Holly Wickman, of course, who's uh, been instrumental in bringing everyone together. There's a suggested reading list out on the web page, and the rest is discussion. I want to say I completely agree with you. And I characterize it as the Dark Ages because I had 30 seconds to give a history of Western civilization. And the important point I was trying to get across was the classics can be neglected. And a lot of that did happen in the Middle Ages. But you're totally right, the Middle, of age, Middle Ages gave us a lot. Also trade, and you didn't mention trade arrangements. Architecture. Um, the Middle Ages was not really a time where nothing good happened. So, thank you. Do you know if the classics department is going to return to the U of I in the future? I have, the question was, do I know if the classics department is going to return to U of I anytime soon? Mm -hmm. I have no reason to think so. Um, I don't know if you guys know the history of the classics department. The key faculty who were here when I arrived retired, and that's a story also. Um, and the classics department was eventually moved into the Department of uh, Languages, Foreign Languages, which kind of makes sense, history and foreign languages. Um, and the classics program was just eliminated this year. So as of next year, the University of Idaho will not have a classics department, will not have a classics program, and as far as I know, will not have any classicists. I think that was a cost-cutting measure. Although I did some uh, arithmetic and I found that if you took the salaries of two associate deans and put them together, you would have enough money to support an entire department of classics and a good one. So I'm a little bit bitter. I have no reason to believe classics departments will return to the University of Idaho. Prove me wrong. Yeah. Actually, I really like the talk. I enjoyed it. It's Thanks, kind Alan. of funny because yesterday I was asking a student if he'd ever read Chaucer this is a student in his fourth year now, his fourth semester here, and he said, what's that? <laughs> and, you know, I just assumed that in high school everybody had to read something just to teach teaching the history of the English language. So it's not just that we are ignorant of uh, previous civilizations, we're actually ignorant of very, you know, the beginnings of our current civilization. But I do, wanna, I do wonder, um, if we think of this as a zero-sum game, and you want to introduce more classics, what do you think can be reduced in our curriculum or in our 
right. uh, in the university culture. Well, I, I didn't give a specific proposal, obviously. Sorry, yeah. and, 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 and to be a little bit more precise, I don't think that everyone should learn classical Greek. I don't think that everyone should have to read every book that I've enjoyed. But I think that we ought to have people on campus who do that so we can talk to them. And we ought to require a more liberal education of our students. Now, what do I think could be eliminated? How politically incorrect do I want to be? <laughs> who, who is this guy at Penn State, the, the football coach? Yeah. Who, who donated hundreds of thousands of dollars of his own money to the classics department and went, did fund driving, fundraising activities for the classics department. This is a football guy who knew uh, where his civilization came from. I think universities spend way too much on entertainment, on providing entertainment to the general public, including sports. I think that's an area to cut. I mentioned associate deans. If you go through the list of uh, University of Idaho salaries, you will discover that almost everyone with a six-figure salary, almost all of them are administrators. But, you know, I mean, I was sort of thinking that a slightly different question. In other words, uh, if you reestablished a classics program here, what would draw people to it, or how would it be, uh, uh, how would uh, student curricula be uh, rearranged to incorporate the opportunity or something to take more classics in place of X? Yeah, no, no, that's a great question. Um, that's a very good question. In the first place, I don't think we need to answer that question in order to argue that classics should return to the university, right? We ought to have a place where we can go to talk about the classics, right? Even if the students aren't required to take those classes. That said, uh, and I proposed this at the university when I was on the Vision Resources Task Force. I do think we need a real core curriculum in the university, one where people learn about the humanities on par with the sciences. Now, the flip side of this is I think calculus is as beautiful as Lucretius. Okay? So I think our students ought to be getting a balanced liberal education. I'm talking about the undergraduate curriculum. Uh, so I would revise the curriculum that way. But keep in mind, this really isn't a curricular issue. This is an issue of respect and priorities. Even more important than figuring out where the classics fit into the curriculum, I think it's important to realize that they're important to who we are and to respect and honor that tradition. I don't, you know, even if my vision is totally screwy and I can't find a way to implement it, it's still the right thing to do. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, what do you think of renaming this institution Idaho High Ohio Polytechnic now that there's no classics? <laughs> I get the feeling that that was a leading question. <laughs> <laughs> the question was why don't we call it Idaho Polytechnic now that there are no classics? A good institution, but possibly not a university. Uh, and and let's, remind, let's remember that we have some other humanities departments as well who are very good. And, and we have some, uh, like a wonderful music program. Um, so it is not a polytechnic university. I went to an institute of technology. That's where I got my graduate degrees. So I know exactly what this is. Uh, I think that's too cynical. I, I, I genuinely do. What we should say is, is if, if we think our reason for existence at the University of Idaho is to train people for jobs at Micron or wherever, we ought to say that. Instead of saying we're giving you a higher education we should say we're training you for a future career, I think. It's not a matter of renaming the university. It's a matter of being honest. Other, other questions? Yeah. You know, they say it's classic based, but their curriculum isn't classic based in the sense that it's, uh, I, the question was, do I think that New St. Andrews does a good job with a classic education? And I have to say, I don't really know, because I don't know what their curriculum is. I know they say it's classics, but from what I've seen, their idea of classics is um, Sinclair Lewis. Is that, no, what's his name? C.S. Lewis. 
So their, their idea of classics is going back to the guy who wrote Narnia and teaching the things that he thought were important. Um, that's the impression I get speaking to students who've gone through the new St. Andrews curriculum. I could be totally wrong. I would love to think I was wrong. At least they're saying the right things. And they are teaching Latin, and they are teaching rhetoric, which is incredibly important. We don't do it these days. So I don't want to completely diss new St. Andrews, but I, I don't want to claim that they're following the classical ideal either. One more question. Okay. I happen to have all of these books on my shelf at home because my husband does teach classics in his English class. Um, I've never read them. So if I'm going to pick one to start with, what do I pick? One classics book. <laughs> I have had that question many, many times, believe it or not, and I have an answer, and it's a very clear answer. I have no question in my mind about it. If you were to read one book, I would read Richard Lattimore's translation of the Odyssey. 